diastolic dysfunction is very important in echocardiography and shouldn't be underestimated. But measuring diastolic dysfunction or grading filling pressures accurately is not always that easy. Especially when we talk about clinical phenotypes of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, we need to understand diastolic dysfunction. First of all, and that will be discussed at the end of this lecture, tinkling sugar can be pretty cool. Why this is specifically cool in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, as said, we will discuss at the end of this video when we talk about the possible treatments. First of all, before we talk about the half path, we have to understand what diastolic dysfunction actually is. Well, it is a combination of inadequate filling of the left ventricle with a pathological relaxation and a reduction in LA function. And therefore, all this combined together leads to elevated filling pressures of the left ventricle. This is needed to still provide for an adequate stroke volume. So why measure diastolic dysfunction? Well, diastolic dysfunction is important when we talk about heart failure, not heart, only heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but also heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or mildly reduced ejection fraction. People can have dyspnea, they can suffer from edema. Diastolic dysfunction gives us prognostic information and people who have a Diastolic dysfunction with elevated filling pressures can have a reduced exercise capacity. And the old folks with the stiff hearts, they will need treatment. The causes for diastolic dysfunction overall are various. People who have diabetes, who are overweight, people who suffer from very often long-standing hypertension and remodeling of the heart. Aging, of course, is a factor which can contribute to diastolic dysfunction. As mentioned previously, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction also always have some degree of diastolic dysfunction. Patients who have a dilated cardiomyopathy, a restriction, so restrictive cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, coronary artery disease, also valvular pathologies can cause diastolic dysfunction. And patients who have a left bundle branch block or have ventricular pacing to also have a degree of diastolic dysfunction. So it's quite easy to say why measure. Well, we need it for monitoring, monitoring of the filling pressures and correlated with the clinical status of our patients. We need it for prognosis and very often the measurements and echocardiography can give us hints towards the cause why filling pressures are actually elevated. The definition of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is as follows. So the hearts will be small and stiff, like when you think about hypertensive heart disease. The overall, even though the ejection fraction is preserved, there will be some degree of systolic dysfunction. You can measure it, for example, also in longitudinal strain, or global strain imaging. There will be an atrial dysfunction and this leads to elevated filling pressures. Here we have a summary of the current guidelines and the diagnostic criteria for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, also for the treatment strategies. And there we already talked the first time about why tinkling sugar is actually pretty cool. Well, let's have a look first at the last mentioned study over here. So the diagnostic algorithm, where we see that the echocardiographic diagnosis of diastolic dysfunction not about half path in a patient with left ventricular ejection fraction of or above 50%, you have to have over the half of the following criteria positive. The reduced E prime velocity, the E to E ratio, or the E to E prime ratio, the left atrial enlargement by left atrial volumetric index and the elevated estimated systolic pulmonary arterial pressure, which you can measure with the TR signal. If you want to know more about this diagnostic algorithm and about diastolic dysfunction overall, you can click the top at the box and watch over an hour of diastolic dysfunction by means of the newest guidelines. A score, we can also use the so-called HFA PEF score. It was from 2019, published in 2019. And there it says that half PEF diagnosis can be made in a symptomatic patient. So there are two steps. The first step is that the patient has to be symptomatic and the left ventricular ejection fraction has to be preserved. Then five to six points in this score for the different domains, so the minor criteria and major criteria, make the half-path 
diagnosis likely. What we need to measure are again echo measurements. We need the reduction of E prime velocity. We need the increased E to E prime ratio. We need the elevated estimated systolic pulmonary arterial pressures, of course, measured by TR again. And this includes also the global longitudinal strain values, so the normal left ventricular ejection fraction, but a reduced global longitudinal strain. You can measure it with speckle tracking. Also, there are plenty of videos created about speckle tracking and global longitudinal strain. Also, you can click the box again and watch a video about this. So strain imaging is truly fascinating. I'm a huge fan of it. So if you want to know more, I just have to encourage you to try if you have the software and use strain imaging. But to continue with the HFA PEF score, we also need morphological criteria. So the concentric I wouldn't call it LVH per se, but concentric remodeling as we see it in hypertensive heart disease and the left atrial enlargement by means of the left atrial volumetric index. And this also includes the biochemical component, the elevated natriuretic peptides, and it differs also for patients in sinus rhythm and in atrial fibrillation. Then, of course, we have the ESC 2021 guidelines and those guidelines tell us that we have again the left ventricular ejection fraction above or 50 percent plus the symptoms and signs and the objective evidence of a cardiac structural or function abnormality is consistent with the presence of diastolic dysfunction and raised left ventricular filling pressure so it's again about the echocardiographic measurements and the LV filling pressures we also include the natriuretic peptides, the concentric, I will call it not necessarily LVH, but concentric remodeling also can be concentric LVH. But we also need the left atrial enlargement, the increased E to E prime ratio, and of course, again, the SPAP measurement. As a treatment, we have diuretics for symptom control. This is a class one recommendation. Of course, diuretics help to reduce the symptoms, but it surely does not help for prognosis. We don't know that. The treatment of the etiologies and cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular diseases has to be thought of and has to be done. This is also a class one recommendation. So you have to treat coronary artery disease, you have to treat diabetes, you have to treat the, the LDL. So we have a lot of different strategies we have to use, but there is no or not yet a therapy for the HEFPEF listed. In the American Heart Association guidelines from 2022, we have an update of this, I would say we have, again, the left ventricular ejection fraction above for 50%, plus the symptoms and the signs and the evidence of spontaneous or provocable increased left ventricular filling pressure. So if it is not in a resting situation, we are not talking also about stress echocardiography or stress testing for diastolic dysfunction. This is also mentioned in the uh, different scores and is it also mentioned in the diagnostic algorithms. If you have still a patient who has dyspnea with exercise, you can do diastolic stress testing. And of course, we need the elevated natriuretic peptides and non-invasive or invasive hemodynamic measurements are included here as well. The half of treatment now is quite interesting because the diuretics, of course, for symptom control we need. This is a strong recommendation. Also, the guidelines state as a treatment for the HEFPEF, the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, is possible. It's a 2A recommendation with the SGLT2 inhibitors. The 2B recommendation is for ARNIs and mineral corticoid receptor antagonists. So we now have also a recommendation for specific treatment. 